Good morning. Kia ora. Hey, my name is John Birdwell. I'm one of the Connect Group leaders in this church, Every Nation, Auckland City. Just want to welcome all of the uh, people online, the visitors online, as well as our church in Toranga and Hamilton. Uh, greetings. Come on, everybody. Give them a greeting. Woo. All right. Well, ha. Huh. 18 years ago, I actually preached from this pulpit, this wooden pulpit. So hopefully it has the same anointing that it had, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe other things as well. God, I just thank you for who you are. I thank you for this people. I thank you for the love uh, that you know I have for this family. And I thank you for who you are and who you desire to be in each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We've been talking about, uh, did we have the video? Did we show the video? All right, we showed the video. <laughs> the powerful thing about that video is it shows one coal over here that's just gotten a little bit cool. And as it pulls into the fire of the other coals, it heats right back up. And so we want to talk to you. We've been talking to you about being I'm in. I'm in. We love social media. We like all the likes. You, or the likes, whenever you like something, you're saying, oh, I'm in. I like that. So I'm in. The four, we, we want to talk about the four qualities that we're trying to get our people here to embrace. And those four qualities are I'm invited, right? That we are all, you're invited to the family of God you're invaluable to the work of God. You are invested in the church with your time, your talent, your treasure. And today I'm going to talk to you about being influential for the purposes of God. Influential. How many of you would say that you're influential? Oh, come on. Come on. One or two of you. Ryan, come on. I see you want to raise your hand over there, right? It's Sagani. Yep. Thank you, all of you guys. Adrian, did you raise your hand? I know you're influential. You'd be surprised, but all of you are influential, and God wants you to be a people of influence. John Maxwell said, go ahead and change it, yep. John Maxwell said that leadership is influence. Leadership is influence. How do you know, that you're a how do you know if you're a leader? That's right, you look behind you and see if anybody's following, right? Right? That's right. Okay, so... Uh, John Maxwell said that leadership is influence. So if somebody's following you, you're influencing them. Mom and dad, you have children, you are an influencer. That's right. Children at school, if you do anything, you're influencing somebody next to you. God wants us to be influencers. Who influences us? Who influences you? How about entertainers, right? Entertainers? Come on, how many entertainers? Be honest. Entertain, you can say Christian entertainers, all right, Christian, <laughs> Christian artists, all right, worship artists. How, how about uh, athletes? Yeah. Yeah, come on, uh, Infe, there you go, athletes. How many, come on, guys, nobody watches. <laughs> all right, athletes, how about church leaders? We got some church leaders that influence you? Hopefully that's true. You know, social media, we've got Facebook, there's Facebook, there's Instagram, and, and all the people that are on there that have Facebook pages or Instagram pages have what? Followers. Yes. They've got followers. So if, they're, if they have followers, that, what does that make them? Influencers. Influencers. What does that also make? That makes them leaders. They're leaders. They're influencers. So let's look at, I want to look online here. I want to look at the top social media influencers today. Look at this screen. All right. You would have thought that Justin Bieber would have been number. I know you all thought that, right? <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Cristiano Ronaldo, football. Come on, see all those hands. How many of those people? How many knows Justin Bieber? Okay. No, it wasn't the same amount. Cristiano, see, that's why. He's got 517 million followers. Yeah, I'm not going to say who raised their hand. All right. Justin Bieber has 455 million followers. Ariana Grande, Selena Gomez, Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift has 361 
million followers. And you know, I had another one up there, 300, go to the next one, 343 <laughs> followers. Thank you, thank you, Lord. It's quality, not quantity. Thank you, Jane. It's my wife. You know that we become, it's true, we become what we behold. And what's even more true is that we become a reflection of what influences us. So think about what influences you. You're actually, your character, you become... Uh, a reflection of what, uh, of what influences you. We most reflect the character of what we behold. So you actually do. You listen to a lot of a certain thing and you start to walk like that and talk like that and, and you find yourself, uh, you know, I, I find that certain genres of music, depending on who's listening to it, they start to, to talk like that. And even songwriters that I've known in the past, they start to write songs like that. And so uh, that, that is, you know, truly our character is reflectant of what we behold. W.M. Taylor, a uh, great Scottish preacher of the late 1800s, said that influence is the exhalation of character. So that basically means what we breathe in is what we breathe out. Think about it. <clears throat> what the world today is desperately in need of are people of faithfulness, uh, and godly character who will influence those around them to live holy lives. You know what? If the church doesn't do it, who will? God's looking for a people who reflect his character and who are faithful to, go ahead, who are faithful to these next five principles. Go ahead and change that slide. There you go. That's why it's good for somebody up here to have control of that, right? It's, all right. So these next five principles... Uh, we, we are, I want you to say this, I am, I am a, person a person of destiny. I want you to say it again. I am, I am a, person of destiny. a person of destiny. These. This is a path to victory to becoming a person of destiny. And I want you to get these four, these four things, or five things rather. All right. Number one is promises. God has given you promises. Jeremiah 29, 11, and 12. Many of us know that God... God has plans. He said, I have a plan for you, a plan of good and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God has promises. There's promises throughout the word of God that feed into your spirit and begin to develop your character. And as you believe those, we go to the next slide. As you believe those, you begin to be faithful to God's divine placement in your life. God's divine placement. God says, God sets Every member in the body is pleases him, it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 18. And, and Hebrews 10, 25, it says, it tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is a habit of some. I see some great faces in here. I see some people I know, people who are faithful. I see some people in here that I, or I see some, I have faces in my mind that I don't see here. And I don't know where they are. And maybe they're watching online, but you don't come, you, you don't not come to church because the baby's uh, not, just not waking up. You don't not come to church because, man, we haven't gone tramping in a while as a family. And you can plan those things. Those are good. But man, don't forsake the house of the Lord. Yes. Don't forsake. I'm so glad my mom and dad made, there was no option. There was no plan B. Man, we, they drug us to church. It did, maybe if it was kicking and screaming, we were in church. We were in church. I remember sitting on the back row one time, and I was cutting up with one of my friends, and my dad was the pastor. So that's even worse. So he's preaching, he's preaching, and he stops the service, and he says, John, come down here and sit with your mother. <laughs> so, but we were there. We were there. It made a lasting impression. God wants us to be faithful to his sovereign positioning. His sovereign positioning. Psalm 37, 34 says, Wait on the Lord and keep his ways, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. That's right. He'll exalt you. We say, oh, man, that's, that's for somebody else. Mm -mm. The next slide. He wants us to receive power of the Holy Spirit. 
Acts 1.8, we know that he's, he gives us power. He gives us power. In the next slide, he gives us power to be influential. He gives us power for his purposes, and his purpose is to make us influential. He gives us power to be his witnesses. Yes. Power to be his witnesses. Is anybody here? Come on. Come on. Are you here? Everybody here? Yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, God wants you, I don't know if I'm getting this across, God wants you to be influential. I mean, look, he's called us to be uh, followers of Jesus, disciples, and as we saw today, people that are trained to be disciple makers. Yes, he's called us to be a disciple making people, to have influence. God wants us to fulfill his purpose and destiny in our lives. He wants to fulfill his purpose and destiny in our lives, and he wants you to know that your purpose Get this, your purpose, is, your purpose and destiny are directly connected to your placement, to knowing your placement. I've heard it said that God sets us. He never sits us. God sets you. He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for you to be a person of influence. I'm going to talk about two people this morning that were people of influence in the Bible. And the first one, one of my heroes, and I'm sure one of yours, is a boy named David. I want us to look at 1 Samuel 17, 2 through 6. I'm going to read this, and I want you to look up here and, and, and listen. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named what? Goliath. Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, I know all of y'all exactly know what that is, right? Six cubits and a span. All right, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of that coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. You know, six cubits, it, six cubits in, 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 my, in the New King James Version, uh, it equals about nine feet, nine inches tall. Now, now I, I don't know about you, but I, I mean, he would have NBA you know, coaches and managers knocking on his door. Uh, actually, they'd have to, they'd have to raise the, uh, the, the, the net. But, but this guy, scholars argue that that was accurate because if that was accurate, he would be the largest man in recorded history. Some believe it was 6'9". Uh, I, I don't want to think it was 6'9", because he might not even make the NBA at 6'9". <laughs> but, but I believe he was a giant. He definitely was a giant. And I, it's kind of like, uh, you know, Jeremy Hunt, you know, fish stories. The more you tell them, the larger the fish gets every time. <laughs> so maybe as the scribes, said, nah, I think I'm going to change it a little bit. But I don't know. I, I'm not, I don't want to rewrite the Word of God. But, um, but I would say that also he had, you, do you know the name Goliath itself? Do you know what it means? It means splendor. The name Goliath means splendor. I mean, he had this coat of, of, of chain mail, this, these shekels, little coins that were all linked together throughout his body, and they weighed 57 kgs, 115 pounds as they, as they, they were on him. And they were bronze, they were all bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs, and he had a bronze helmet, a bronze javelin. You know, actually, when he walked out onto the valley, when the sun hit him, he shined so brightly that it could have blinded the enemy. And that's one of the reasons that his name was Goliath. It, it, was, it was a foretelling of, of what he would become. Splendor. While the armies are at a standoff, there on those battlefield, a shepherd boy is awakened. I love this. It's 1 Samuel 17, 20 says, So David arose early in the morning, and he left the sheep with a keeper and, and took the things and went as Jesse, had, his father, had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to, fight the, bat, to, to, the, to the fight and shouting for the battle. So David gets up early. That's one of my favorite parts. David rose early. I mean, he didn't just like, oh, oh, I think I've got something to do today. No, he was a man on a mission. 
He knew exactly, he knew exactly what his task was for the day, but he was always prepared in his heart and in his mind for a fight. Goliath was taunting the armies of Israel. He was yelling, send someone out to fight me, and if he defeats me, uh, we'll be your servants. But if I defeat him and kill him, you will be my servants. Do you ever have giants that taunt you? David was so confident as he walked in and he heard all this that he, he went up to his brothers and he's asking them, what's going on? And, oh, man, I can take this guy. And, and, and the next thing he said is, uh, but, hey, what's in it for me? <laughs> what's in it for me? And, and somebody came around to David, you know, and he's a, a young, you know, middle-aged, middle teens. Uh, any middle teens in here? Any middle teens in here? All right, middle teens, pastor. Yeah, okay, all right, all right you're right here. Thanks, strong. Come on, Faith. <clears throat> David said, what's in it for me? And they found out, you know what's in it? He's, all right, here's what's in it, guys. Here's what's in it. Riches, the king's daughter, and no taxes. <laughs> Woo, for your whole household. No taxes. You know what, you know what he said? I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> David is brought before Saul. David, you know, the rumor gets out, here's this kid. But truthfully, the army was afraid of Goliath. It says they were afraid and dismayed. But David was brought before Saul, and David looks at Saul, King Saul, and he says, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go out and fight this Philistine. And Saul kindly said to David, <laughs> you're not able to go against this giant to fight him, for you're just a youth. And he's a man of war since his youth. But David said to Saul, I have fought with and killed both lion and bear and delivered the lamb from his mouth. And this godless Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he's defied the armies of the living God. Sometimes you have got to speak to your giants. You got to tell them what they're up against. And it'll build faith in your own heart. To take them. So basically, David said to King Saul, I'm in. I'm invited. God's called me for a great purpose. I'm invaluable. I know who I am, and I know that God is with me. He said, I'm invested. I know that God has placed me in this family, and I won't let any giant keep this family from fulfilling its destiny. I'm positioning myself. He said, now I'm ready for God to make me influential by filling me with his power to defeat this giant. Come on, you got to speak to your giants. David, who was secure in the promise, secure in his placement, secure in his position, secure in his power, secure in the purpose of the Lord. Yeah, come on. Somebody clap your hands for the Lord. Come on, somebody get excited. Anybody uh, watch basketball? Anybody watch basketball? Anybody play basketball? Anybody ever dreamed about playing basketball? <laughs> oh, there, there you are. All right. You may not realize this, but I was once a basketball star. <laughs> don't, don't Google this or anything, but, but back in the fifth grade... <laughs> Our family had just moved to a new city, to Phoenix, Arizona. It was dry, and, and everyone, all the kids would get out during uh, before school, after school, during the, the middle part of the day, and play basketball. And I'm this, I'm this young kid just wanting to fit in. And, uh, and so, I, yeah, yeah, I'll play basketball. Let's do it. Somebody invited me to come. I said, I'll play. You know, and they give me the ball, and, and I, I'm all over the place. I, I mean, I, I can dribble the ball. But I can't shoot the ball, and and I, I I and don't give John the ball, you know. And you ever? I don't know if you know about you know those guys that when they they have the two team captains and they decide, okay, you pick one, then you pick one, and you pick one. I was that last guy, you know. Sorry, this may turn into a whole other thing. But my dad. 
That summer after the fifth grade was over, my dad bought a basketball goal and he set it up on the garage, right in front of the garage with a back stop on it, you know, a new net. And every day I got out there and I played basketball, except for Sunday, I had to be in church. <laughs> I got out there and I played basketball. Why did I play basketball? Well, number one, I didn't want to look like an idiot, but, but I, I played basketball because I wanted to be a person of influence. But you know, in the fifth grade, in the fifth grade, they actually created a nickname for me, as, as young people do for guys like that. You know what? The, the nickname was Bullwinkle. Yeah, and there he is. So... You remember the cartoon Rocky and Bullwinkle? Anybody remember that? All right, I see some heads nodding. All right, so I see heads nodding this way. Nodding. You can Google that. All right, Google that. Bullwinkle is this bumbling, fumbling moose. His name is Bullwinkle J. Moose. I don't know what the J stood for, but Bullwinkle Moose, probably John. But, um, but Bullwinkle Moose, yeah, and, and so that was my nickname. But all summer long, that summer, I worked hard. I practiced basketball every day. I made those shots from the side. I made them from the street. I made them from all over the court. Uh, I tried to do layups, you know, all that. And when I went back to the sixth grade, way back in the sixth grade, when I went to the sixth grade, I got picked last. And this is the true story. So they're playing ball, running back and forth. The team I was on, missed the shot, and one guy on the other team grabbed the ball, and he threw it all the way down the court, and I'm about mid-court, and I jump up in the air, and I caught that ball, and I turned around at mid-court, and I made that shot, and all of a sudden, the game stopped. But then victory was, victory was close at hand, and I don't know if we won the game or not. I just know I made that shot. <laughs> Come on. Bullwinkle, no more. You can get rid of the bullwinkle one now. All right, get rid of that bullwinkle there. All right, you can, yeah, there you go. Thank you. No more bullwinkle. Okay, I want to talk about influential person number two. Influential person number two. Real quickly, uh, a young woman named Ruth. A little background on Ruth. <clears throat> Let me see. Naomi, her, her, what became, who became her mother-in-law, Naomi and Elimelech moved because there was a famine in the land. They had two young boys, Malon and Chilion, or Kilion, depending on how you want to pronounce it. <clears throat> and they, there was a famine in Bethlehem. They left. They went to Moab, which was a country full of pagans. They, they got there, and Elimelech, the father, died. But Malon and Chilion married two women. The two women were Ruth and Orpah. Not Oprah, she's got the talk show. It's Orpah, <laughs> married Orpah. And, and so I want to look at, at something that I, I've never thought about until this, that the day that Ruth got married to Malon, Ruth was part of a pagan culture. She lived in this pagan culture her whole life, and she saw a family that was tightly knit, that had a belief system, they had family values, they had a rich heritage, and, and she was going to become grafted in to this rich heritage. I have to think that on her wedding day, she was full of hope for promises that she believed the Malon and that family were, were giving her. She was full of those promises. Elimelech had died. Marriage gave Naomi even renewed hope. Ruth had to be fascinated by their devotion to family and their rich heritage. And she was about to be joined with them. And there was a promise that she would become connected to this rich heritage and produce heirs that would bring joy and stability to future generations. The joy she must have felt on her wedding day that her life would be long and fruitful. Little baby Malon Jr. and little Elimelech babies running around. That's, come on, come on. Where, where are you? Right down here. I need you to laugh. That was a joke. Sorry. <laughs> totally bomb. No, but she had to be full of joy and hope on that day. And then what happens when tragedy strikes? 
Malon and Chilion die. So we've got left with, with Naomi, the mother-in-law, losing all hope. Because with no men to work, there's no income. So she did what most of us might do. She got bitter. She got angry. And she blamed God. She said, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they all, the three women, came together and they just wept and wept. They, then Orpah decided to leave her mother-in-law and go back to Moab. As a matter of fact, Naomi suggested, why don't both of you just go back? And Orpah did. But Ruth wasn't willing to give up on that promise. Ruth had, got, had a promise on her wedding day, and she said, I'm not going back to that lifestyle. And she clung to Naomi. And I, I want you to look at, at Ruth 1.15. It says, and Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And Ruth's response is one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. Because she had a revelation. Ruth had a revelation of placement. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God. Your God. My God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. See, Ruth held on to the promises. Next slide. Ruth held on to the promises. She clung to God's placement, to spiritual family. She clung to spiritual family. She followed the wise counsel and positioned herself to wait on the Lord of harvest, the Lord of the harvest, which was a man named Boaz, and he redeemed her. He restored her, he married her, and he bought back the land that Naomi and the the wives had both lost. He bought it back, and she, because of her faithfulness, became powerfully influential. Ruth did, by the way, fulfill God's purpose and plan for her life because she followed this path. You see, Ruth married Boaz, and they had a son named Obed. Obed had a son named Jesse, and Jesse had a son named David. Wow. But you know what happened to Orpah? What happened to Orpah? There's not much said in the Bible, but you know, there's a lot of, lot of other texts that are out there, and you know, Jewish tradition and, and, and some Chaldean texts that have been added to that have, have written that Orpah actually left going back to Moab and she had four sons. And these four sons were giants. And one of them's name was Goliath. That's right. One of them's name was Goliath. And the same Goliath that we now find in the Valley of Elah and shouting curses at the armies of God. You know, it leads us to consider that walking away from God's sovereign placement can lead to the creation of giants that will always battle against the purposes of God in our lives. So, a 15-year-old David steps onto the battlefield. Picture it with me, full of faith. David walks toward Goliath. And he reaches down and he picks up five smooth stones. He picks up the stone of promise. This stone is for the promise that God has spoken to me. He picks up a stone of placement. This stone is the placement that God has set me in spiritual family. He picks up the stone of position that this stone represents the years of serving the sheep and positioning myself and waiting on God to bring me into the destiny that he has for me. Yeah, and he, the, then he picked up the fourth stone. The stone is the power of the Lord to overcome the enemies of God. And then he picks up the fifth stone. And this stone is the stone of God's purpose. This is the stone that will strike down the giant that gets in the way of that purpose. And let's look at 1 Samuel 17, 45 and 46. Then David said to Goliath, you come to me with a sword 
and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, and this day I will deliver you. God will deliver you into my hands. Today, you can speak to your giants. God wants to deliver them into your hands. So I want us to, what, so what are your giants that you're facing right now? Maybe fear, maybe confusion over some things, maybe disappointments, things haven't worked out like you'd hoped, negative voices, we can go on and on, you know what your giants are, but we can speak to our giants, what giants or obstacles are in front of you that, that have become so large that you feel like you can't handle them. I want us to speak to our giants today. And I want you to join me with something. I want everybody to stand up. Come on, stand up. All right, I want you to speak to your giants. We're going to say this together. All right? Now, right now, I want you to think of the thing that is coming against you, the thing that has become a giant in your life, and we're going to speak to it right now. Are you ready? No, come on. Are you ready? All right. You come to me with fear, with confusion, with disappointment, with negative voices, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the harvest, Jesus, who redeems me with his blood, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Come on. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, Chrissy, if you can come on up. Um, I just want you to know that that enemy, don't stay, stand up, keep standing up. That enemy that's attacking your life can go. And you can speak to it with faith. And if you're in the right placement to believe in God's promises, God will position you to receive power to fulfill the purposes he has for you in your life. God wants to set you in. He wants to place you in spiritual family. This morning, I want to speak to a couple of different people. You may be a person this morning who has battled many battles for many years. For many years. And you may be a person this morning that has said, I I can't win this. I can't win this. And you come to church every Sunday morning, and you think that if I just come to church, maybe things will get better. If you, if you just maybe come to church, maybe God will do something. And I believe you're here this morning, maybe even that one last time, to say, I believe that I, I, I want to believe in all that I hear these these people saying from the pulpit. You may have come to this church all your life, but never really been connected to spiritual family, and especially never been connected to Jesus. You know, he's the Lord of the harvest. Jesus already paid the price. All you have to do is reach out to Jesus with a heart of repentance. 1 Corinthians 5.17 says that that everything becomes new. He can change those things in your life. It says you become a new creation. Jesus is the only light that can totally get rid of darkness. He's the only light. It says I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, but he's the only light. And he's speaking to you today. He's speaking to you today to come. You know, I think of, of all that God has brought me through. He didn't just set me down in a chair and I rode the roller coaster ride. I had to actually be set in spiritual family. I had to come back to that spiritual family and I had to reach out and ask Jesus to take me as I am. And I remember that great song, Just As I Am. Just As I Am. Jesus loves you just as you are. You make it, you made a lot of mistakes. You may be still making mistakes. You don't know how you can get out of making mistakes. 
But I believe what he wants to do with you this morning is he wants to change your life. And so I want to ask you, let's every head bow, every eye closed. I want to ask you this morning, if you have never asked Jesus, and you don't grow up in church and say, I've been a Christian all my life, I grew up in church. There's a point in your life when you've got to confront that giant that's telling you who you're not. And you've got to turn away from that thing and you've got to trust Jesus who says who you are. So if you this morning, if you're a person who says, I want Jesus to take my life and I want to become all that he has for me, maybe you've, you've never asked Jesus to become Lord and Savior of your life, but you want to do it this morning, I want you to raise your hand right now. Just raise it up right now. Raise it up right now. I know there's somebody out there. I know somebody's holding on. I remember holding on to the back row, the pew on the back row. <laughs> and all of a sudden I found myself to the, at the front of the, the altar giving my life to Jesus. One more time, I want to ask you to raise your hand. If you've never asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life, raise your hand. All right, all right. I want to pray for you. Lord Jesus, I ask you to touch every heart in this place. I ask you, Lord God, to, to the promises and the things, the dreams that you've placed in the hearts of people in this, in this church. I ask you to convict those who don't know you that it's okay to reach out and just take you by the hand. And that even if this invitation is over and church is over, they can still walk right up front and talk to any one of us who are disciple makers. And we can lead them to you. I want to speak to another, amen. I want to speak to another group. This is the group that loves to sit on the bench. This is the, the group that loves to do church, but not be the church. I spent so many years of my life just showing up, but not ever dressing out. And I just, I, I'm telling you right now, it, there may be work involved. <laughs> there will be. There may be things to, it is the most rewarding thing in the world to get up off the bench and get set in your proper placement in a spiritual family. It is the most incredible thing. There are people out here, there are people online listening right now that are watching, that are members of this church, that you should have been here, but I'm going to believe that God is calling you right now to come back and be faithful. That if you will come back and be faithful, God is going to radically shift something in your life. Giants will be put down. And you'll begin to walk in the sovereign placement and purpose of the Lord. God's calling you back. God's calling you back. Are you all in with your time, your talent, your treasure? God wants you to be this morning. So I want to ask you again, every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would just say, John, I, I want to get off the bench and I want to be a player. I want to be influential. I don't know how, I'm kind of a shy person, but I, 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 I want to be all that God has for me. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody's watching. And you would just say, I want to be all that God has for me. I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand. I'm raising my hand. I don't, everybody in here should be raising their hand if you want God to be all that God has for you. There's people all over the room that are raising your hand. All over the room. Because you want to get off the bench. You want to fight those giants. You don't want to just sit and let things hammer you down anymore. You want to stand up and follow Jesus. So I'm going to pray for all of you right now. All of you right now. Praise you, Lord. Father, I thank you for these church members. I thank you for these sheep. I thank you for the people that are here in this church. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to fight our giants. Father, I pray that you would touch every heart. I pray for a new level of faith to rise up in this house. I pray for, for a, a David kind of faith 
that steps onto the battlefield, that isn't afraid of a fight, that shows up when they're tired, that doesn't let circumstances keep them from the house of God, a people who will join together and come together for your purpose and your destiny. Father, I thank you that this church has been called to be a people of destiny. So I thank you for them right now. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, the Lord of the harvest, you redeemed us, you restore us, and you call us. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.